Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back into some more bite-sized business advice. And today's episode is not so bite-sized. This is a big deal. We're talking about cash. We're talking about how cash is king. And really, it's a conversation of what are you focused on? Are you focused in the right areas? A lot of people talk about their revenue, but cash flow is way more important and it's an important conversation because i've been on both sides of it so we're going to dive in with a very special guest his name is peter kingma he has a book that's recently come out and we're going to learn all about this topic so peter welcome to the show thanks for being here hey thanks brandon great great to be here so cash is king i'm sure we've already upset some people but we we have someone else's attention i'm very sure so uh, tell me, what are what are we really talking about? I, I hinted at cash flow, cash first revenue. What do you mean when you say cash is king? Cash is cash is uh, what keeps companies afloat. You can be a profitable business and go bankrupt, right? If you can't pay your bills. And so, um, you know, the what 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 I like to think, Brandon, is that everyone understands this. But what I found um, in in years of practice of advising companies is that. We have a really good understanding of revenue and most people in business, um, you know, not just the founders, but the people who work generally have a good understanding of the role that they play in generating revenue um, and or in cost, right, in um, how to prevent uh, costs and ex the expense side of it. But most people outside of maybe the top two folks in a business don't really understand the impact that they make on a daily basis that that uh, will impact liquidity, either positively or negatively. And so, you know, so vitally important because it takes cash to grow a business, to pay your payroll, to um, weather storms. Yeah, and it's amazing too, because you you kind of, you painted the picture of what everyone looks at, revenue and expenses, costs, well, what's in the middle? What's left? That's what we're talking about. Why, why do people ignore that little middle piece that's so important? because it can be boring. I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, process steps, you know, involved in how you, how you generate cash. So if you, you know, here's the simplest formula, right? So you, let's just say you're a manufacturing company, the same could be applied to services businesses, but you have to go out and buy material. So you, you're laying out cash, right? You get that material, you make something with it. There's probably more cash involved in doing that. Then you sell it. Right. And then it takes time to collect that cash. And so that conversion cycle of how you invest to, to make something and to sell something to collect, you know, is what generates real wealth for you, because that that's then the cash that you can then use to reinvest, to you know, uh, expand, whatever. But some of those internal processes associated with what I just described, um, you know, can get very opaque very quickly. Uh, just take billing, for example. You know, it's nobody goes into business because we love billing, right? We go into business because we have something we're really passionate about, but how we get the bills out the door and how accurately we get them out the door and how we do credit checks on our customers. So all of those steps involved in invoicing, billing and collecting, while they're not very fun, they're vital. And that, and it really, you know, it's money that should be in your pocket, not in somebody else's pocket. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it too, and it's it's the unfortunate truth that that stuff is kind of kind of boring, and that's not why we got into business, but it'll put you out of business real quick, and it kind of sneaks up on you too in a lot of cases. So, um, I'm curious your your background on this. You're you're in uh, you work with big businesses. Um, our audience is is more on the small business side, um, their experience, but this stuff still it's very very present. So, what do you see as the crossover from Big business to small business, where we kind of drop the ball on on focusing on cash flow. Yeah, I think this. I think the issues are the same. It's just the the, the clients I work with. It's they're much bigger, and so the, the issues become even more pronounced. But so I lead the working capital practice for Ernst and Young in the Americas. And so I work with you know very very big companies, uh, companies everybody would recognize, 
And you know what I find is that even those very big, large organizations struggle with some of those basic concepts that I described in the book that are so vital um, to ensuring positive cash flow. Um, and the reason I wrote the book, Brandon, is because I wanted to take those concepts and, and provide them in a format that a smaller business would understand. And, and, and also, you know, to your point, do it in a way that's not boring. <laughs> and I hope I've done that. So I, I created a fictitious company. So each chapter, the, the characters are trying to solve a problem. So I wanted to take something that could norm, you know, could possibly be very dry subject matter and make it something that's a little more lively with you know best practices at the end of each chapter that people can take and apply to their businesses. I love that. It, it already sounds interesting. Uh, full disclosure, I have not read the book. Um, I just met Peter today as we're recording this, but I do want to check it out because this it sounds like a really, really interesting way to explain such an important topic. So I don't know if we're allowed to do this, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, are, are you allowed to give us an example from the book um, and while you're doing that, let me let me put your website on the screen. If you want a copy of the book, um, you can head on over to Peter's website. It's on the screen. It's in the show notes down below. Um, but are you allowed to kind of paint the picture of what one of these examples looks like so we can really relate it to our businesses? Yeah. You no. Know, so I, I mentioned, um, you know, at the very beginning, the first. So I lay out the book um, kind of initially talking about what trade working capital is. Right. So trade working capital is your accounts receivable. So it's money people owe you accounts payable, what you have to pay others, and inventory. Now, inventory, I break that out over, I forgot, in six chapters or so, because there's so many different um, aspects of inventory management, everything from production to logistics, um, even to some accounting principles. Fear not, I will try not to put you to sleep when I talk about some of those. But, you know, and, and the important metrics that, you know, that you might want to consider, uh, you know, sort of following or capturing. Um, so I've mentioned the billing piece on procurement. You know, what, one thing I've observed is sometimes we incent people in procurement to drive the lowest cost possible, right? So, but doing so, maybe we're now sourcing material from Asia and that comes with a longer lead time or maybe a, a bigger, you know, greater minimum order quantity requirement. So suddenly we now have tied up more cash or capital in the business in inventory. Um, and so we talk about how to make those trade-off decisions. Maybe it's the right decision, but how do you how do you evaluate the economic impact of those decisions, or how do you evaluate the cost to serve of your customers? You know, it's not just the materials that you're providing them or the services you're providing, but it could even be tied up in the way that you write the contracts and the service level agreements that you've got, and when you can bill them, and how they will and how they will pay you, how they'll remit. So it's it's I, I try and set out a, you know tools and examples to evaluate those costs so that you can make informed decisions because at the end of the day you know every dollar that you spend in your business costs the same but does not produce the same rate of return right so if you're investing in inventory for example that just sits around for you know weeks and months. Um, that's that's non-productive versus you know wanting to invest in something that's going to produce maximum return. This is why I love this conversation. So everything we do at at What If revolves around the harmonious architecture, which is obviously the name of the show. It's not about putting every business into a box. It's about understanding your business and specifically how how your business runs. And what I'm hearing you say is the very same thing with cash flow. And where I hear a lot of entrepreneurs get hung up and they they get they just miss on this area is exactly what you said. Where, oh, I found a way to get this product for 17 cents where I'm normally getting it for 32 cents, but I need to buy seven times more. And they don't connect those dots. So wh what are the common pitfalls you see in terms of uh, cash flow or, or lack thereof in yeah, the, the small business world? I'll tell you the biggest one is we love sales, right? And, and especially as we're growing a business, we love revenue. We get very excited, and so we get to, you know, we get into a, a sales process, and uh, we're very excited about getting the deal. And then maybe at the end of the deal, then all of a sudden we have to agree to payment terms that maybe 120 days um, or certain service level requirements that we've got to meet. And so again, it is baking kind of those decisions into the sales process. 
And maybe if we're incenting salespeople, we should incent them not just on revenue generated, but on revenue collected so that they then participate, you know, sort of in that, uh, you know, in that discussion around how you're going to collect your revenue, because it's, it's not about the, you know, if, if, remember, you still pay taxes on revenue, whether you've collected it or not. And so if it's not in your pocket, you know, it doesn't really count. Um, so, yeah, so the big, you know, a big trap that people fall into is, is you know, chasing revenue without fully understanding, um, you know, some of the ramifications of some of the commercial terms that you, uh, you know, that you have to agree to. That seems like a bigger conversation, though, the as far as the, the salespeople, because that's a culture shift. If you're saying you are a salesperson, your job is to go out, get orders, get sales, collect revenue. And now you're saying, oh, we also want you to be part of the collection of, of cash, of dollars. Uh, some people might push back. So how, have you have you done this in organizations? Like, how do you structure that conversation and make it more of a team and collaborative effort? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I refer to this as creating a cash culture um, because I again, I think we're we do a, a decent job of explaining revenue. We do a decent job of explaining expense. Um, but the third leg of the stool is is the cash. It's the liquidity. It's the conversion of all that into the cash that you then use to pay your bills, to invest, um, to weather storms, you know, reward your your investors, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah. So step one is. Who has decision rights in the business, and how are they? And how are they? Um, you know, do they have the tools and the and the resources to be able to make the right decisions? So we talked about salespeople and the way they they set up agreements. Um, we talked about uh, procurement and um, you know and how they're how they're sourcing materials. Maybe you know understanding that low cost isn't always the best the best answer. Um, you know how you forecast um, production as well is is you know is very important. Um, and so. The step one is really ensuring that that you know who is making those decisions and that you've given them the tools that they need to make those those informed decisions. The other bit about this is if you've done a really good job sort of tightening things up, you know, you've really you're 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 good about getting your invoices out, you're good about collecting, you've been really disciplined about procurement, et cetera. Um, how you forecast your cash is also critically important, right? Because if you have if you can't forecast when you've got disbursements and um, and, and you know and money going out the door or receipts and disbursements rather, um, then that's cash you can't use. So let me give you a crazy example, uh, Brandon. When I was right out of college, I was living paycheck to paycheck, um, and you know fortunately my employer paid me on the first and the fifteenth, and fortunately. Uh, my landlord uh, collected, you know, rent on, you know, a certain day of the month and he didn't come knocking on the door demanding, you know, whenever he wanted it. Now, even if my employer paid me, you know, 50 percent more, but then said, I'm going to pay you 50 percent more, but I'm not going to tell you what day of the week I'm going to pay you or what day of the month, rather. Or my landlord said, I'll I'll reduce your rent by 20 percent, but I'm going to choose to come whatever day in the month and, and collect that. I would have to hold on to significantly more cash that's not productive um, to be able to meet those, those spikes. And so the same thing applies to business is that if we don't understand those drivers that impact receipt of cash, so what people are paying us, or the disbursement of cash, what we're gonna have to pay lay out or you know, our expenses, um, then, then that's non-productive cash. And we may have it, it may be in our bank account, but that means that you know, if we've got a competitor that suddenly stumbles and we wanna pounce, we, or we want to buy some new equipment, um, you know, it's it's cash then that's not as productive. So so it's a not only the decision rights are important, but it's also important to ensure that all your processes are in alignment so that you can project you can project when you're going to have that cash. It's such a it's such a spot on scenario, and I couldn't help but think as you were describing it, like it sounds miserable. Like that would be the absolute worst nightmares. I don't know when I'm going to get paid. And I also know for sure someone's going to want me to pay them. And I don't know if I'm going to have the cash. And at the same time, it's like, that's everybody's small business. <laughs> in a nutshell, we all get ourselves in that scenario. And really what I'm hearing you say is throughout this whole conversation, cash is king. Yes, got that part. Um, I'm pretty good at picking up titles of books. But more importantly than that, we're thinking about money and we're thinking about cash flow differently. So what is the mindset that you're really hoping small business owners adopt about their cash flow? What's the shift in mindset? 
it's the, the, the cash that you generate from your operations is the cheapest form of capital that you'll ever have access to. And so, you know, we are very familiar with debt and the ability to go out and borrow, but borrowing comes with a significant cost, right? And there's only, even when, even, you know, sadly the, the cost of debt is high right now or, or significantly higher than it has been in the last few years. But even when it was, when it was lower, you know, go back to the pandemic days, um, there's only so much debt you can take on before you become too leveraged, right? So debt is a, debt's a complicated thing. Uh, raising capital through through equity is also has a has significant cost to it, right? You give up ownership, um, you know, you've got you've got to pay that, uh, the, you know, the, the, the access to that capital as well. So, but the cost, the, the cash that you can generate by taking those inputs, selling them, and then collecting them, whether it's a service business or a, or a manufacturing business, is going to be the cheapest form of capital that you'll ever have. And so that's a, I don't know that people always think of it that way. I think they. You know, they think about, again, how much revenue we're generating and how excited we get from that. But we don't think about then the liquidity aspect of it and, and what it takes. And so sometimes we've got a lot of revenue, but then we go to the bank and we take out another loan because we want to expand something. And if I had that cash, if I could convert that faster and be more efficient and maybe not hold on to as much inventory, for example, non-productive inventory, um, then that's cash I could apply that's going to have a higher rate of return than anything I'm going to have to pay debt service on. Mm, yeah, I, I remember as you were talking, I've never heard it described quite like that. So thank you for that. I had a coach in, in my last business very early on, and he told me, I'm curious what you think about these numbers and if they're still true. It was commonplace in that industry to take an order, and it was manufacturing business, so take an order, uh, deliver it within two to four weeks, so 15 to 30 days, and then not get paid until it was produced. But obviously we have to outlay the cash to produce it, pay people to produce it, and you can see how this cycle stacks up. It's kind of what we're talking about. He said a company that is able to collect cash in full, payment in full at the time of the order, is able to grow seven times faster. And that just completely blew my mind and I started looking at cash completely differently. Just like you're saying, I'm curious if that number seems right to you or if you have different stats behind it. I love it. I haven't, you know, I should, I should go and uh, test that out with, um, with some case studies we've got. I, I don't know that I've heard the, the exact number of seven, seven times, but I think the principle is absolutely directionally correct, whether it's seven times or five times. I think that's absolutely correct that, you know, because again, that is, that is capital that you can then continue to deploy and that's wealth creating capital, right? So if you've got, if you've got money tied up in receivables that people owe you, you you have become a bank to your customers. And, and, it, and probably a bank that doesn't charge interest, probably a very bad, you know, not for profit bank. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and if or if you're paying too fast to your supply base, if you haven't evaluated, you know, sort of where your strength is in the buying process um, and you haven't you haven't looked at what commercial terms are and you're just accepting whatever is out there, um, you know, then then you are you're you're you know you're funding your suppliers versus funding yourself now let me make a let me make a, a caveat to that nothing is a zero sum game right so with particularly with suppliers you know you don't want um and i and this is what i advise big big companies on because you know sometimes they have the ability to really push the needle on on payment terms you know really 120 days take it or leave it this is what you know this is what uh, the terms are going to be what we're going to pay you in um you want to make sure you've got a healthy supply base. You want to have healthy relationships with your suppliers. And so it's not all about just kind of squeezing them to the, you know, to the fullest extent, but it is understanding, you know, sort of what power you have in that equation and, and looking at even things like, should I consolidate some of my spend to gain greater power or do, you know, have I consolidated too much of my spend and now I'm too beholden on one or two suppliers and I really need to de-risk that. So it's it's really going through that sort of evaluation of how you, you know, how how you set up your whole procurement process, you know, who you're buying from. Do you understand what the prevailing terms are for those commodities? And are you and you are you ensuring that you're getting, you know, sort of the best possible deal for yourself while still maintaining a healthy relationship with your suppliers? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously a much bigger conversation. I, I wish we could go. Uh, we could probably go for seven hours on this and just dissect every single aspect of it. And it would be more than beneficial for small business owners. 
we can't do that. But that's why, again, I have your link uh, to your website and to the book on the screen. It's in the show notes down below. Um, who's who's the perfect small business owner to read this book? I think everybody. <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, honestly, I mean, I think because I think the principles now maybe, you know, there's different chapters that might make more sense to others. I do lay out a manufacturing company as my example. But then in the last chapter, I then explain how that applies to professional services firms, to retail, to those in the healthcare industry. So I lay out examples, you know, while I kind of set up a, the, the scenario of the fictitious company's manufacturing, I do try and explain how that applies to, to other types of businesses as well. I love it. That's a fantastic, fantastic idea and principle for a book. So uh, Peter, thank you so much for being here. This was a great episode. Thank you. So I love to end these episodes before I let you go on the most important part, at least in my opinion, it's so easy to just fall asleep for 20 minutes and, and hear this great information and do absolutely nothing with it. I'm looking at you listeners, but we want you to actually take this information and grow your business with it. So we believe at what if powerful questions get powerful answers. And I want to know in, in the context of this conversation, we're talking about cash is king, cash flow for your small business. Peter, what is a powerful question you want the listener to be asking themselves about their cash flow uh, so they can grow their business and actually stay in business and not have the cash monster bite them in the butt. What would you do if you had twice the amount of cash in your bank account? Would you, would you, would there be a new opportunity to grow? Would there be, uh, are, is there a rainy day coming? Um, you know, are there, are there people you want to go hire that you haven't been able to? Um, because that's really what we're talking about. It's how do you, how do you evaluate your business operations today? And try and generate at least you know twice as much of cash that you could have at any you know any give any given point in time to be able to deploy. I love it. If your answer was I would go to the casino, it's the wrong answer. Okay, so go back and think about it again. Go re-listen to this episode. Go grab Peter's book. This was a great episode. Uh, thank you for watching and listening wherever you are. Make sure you subscribe. We love bringing these episodes to you five days a week to help you grow your business, get out of the bubble you find yourselves in and hopefully learn something about how to be a more sustainable, more harmonious business. See what we did there? We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch.